to get up, you need a little revive. If you want to get up, you need a little revive. I don't know what to say. <laughs> What's going on, buddy? My name is Elephant, and welcome back to yet another reaction video. And today we're checking out another SCP video. This is made by Dr. Bob. This is SCP-6531, Anthology of Horrors. I do not think I've ever seen this before. I'm going into this completely blind. I really don't know what else to say because I don't know what I'm really expecting. So I don't really have much to say in the beginning of this video. So without that truly being said, because I don't know what else to say, let's get right into this in three, two, one. On shipping. Cackling fills the air, underscored by bolts of lightning crackling across the sky. A crazed man stands in a grubby lab coat, one Dr. Viktor Lazarevich, whose license huh? to practice medicine and storm powered <clears throat> reanimation has long been revoked. The mad scientist is surrounded by bubbling containers, beakers, and flasks overflowing with smoking chemicals strewn around the room. He checks his cracked watch. It's nearly time. He darts across the room, passing between slabs covered in sheets. Underneath are his specimens, each one made exactly why are we going with the Frankenstein route? and serving as perfect examples of why the medical and scientific communities have made efforts to excommunicate. Also, I'm noticing Dr. that um, Dr. Bob's voice has changed slightly. Is the Dr. Bob? And this video is quite recent. What's going on? What did his voice change all of a sudden? The scientist eyes. The I mean, it's subtle, but he had it fixed to the roof through an open skylight that lets in the howling, freezing October wind and brings the rain from outside pouring through. His makeshift laboratory is already a mess. He doesn't care. Checking his watch again, he reaches for a lever on the wall, waiting with bated breath for the right moment. Any second now, he tells himself, heart drumming against his ribs. He looks over at his covered creations, almost with sentiment. He's worked tirelessly to create them all, and soon the power of the storm will course through their veins and compel them to stand. Some were visible out from beneath their sheets, a patchwork arm made from fingers, a palm, a forearm, and a bicep, all taken from different cadavers and recycled. <coughs> Another lies perfectly still on the slab, arms crossed over its chest. One's webbed, scale-covered hand is just poking out from underneath. What? They and all the others were wired up to the coil, standing on the roof above. The mad scientist's watch beeps. It's time. He pulls down on the lever, just as a bolt of lightning rockets through the air, striking the coil on the roof. An enormous shower of sparks erupts from the ceiling, the lever spraying over the thin sheets on the slabs, burning holes in some of them. Electricity flows down the cables and into each of the bodies. Gradually, they begin to awaken, met by the sound of more maniacal laughing and triumphant yells from Dr. Lazarevich. They're alive. Before it became the site of an okay. annual anomalous anthology of horrors, SCP-6531 had previously been the manufacturing center for Lazarevich wearables. Oh. Investigations into this company by the SCP Foundation yielded little in the way of actionable intelligence. All that could be learned about Lazarevich wearables was that they used to be a small-scale clothing distributor, their specialty being Halloween costumes and masks, as well as horror-themed streetwear and everyday clothing. Oh, okay. Very few business records from Lazarevich wearables still exist. After falling victim to bankruptcy in December of 1996, any information about the company, its operations, and distributors all seems to have been thoroughly and mysteriously expunged. Efforts are still being made to track down and interview any former employees of the costume-making company to determine if any of them were aware of any connection between Lazarevich wearables and various known anomalous groups of interest. However, there also exist no records of any employees who might have worked at the manufacturing center. Similarly, no costume stores, either smaller local businesses or larger national chains, have been reported to have sold costumes or clothing made by Lazarevich wearables, neither as seasonal items nor all year round. 
The okay. only thing the Foundation has been able to ascertain is that Lazarevich wearables fell into bankruptcy approximately 10 months before the first anomalous incident recorded there took place. So was it just an anomalous company? I mean, they're not... None of the stores that, that would have had this stuff sold to them didn't have any recollection or anything known about them. And the SCP Foundation has very little information about them, so... I'm just going to say that they popped up out of nowhere. Still, that knowledge does little to explain exactly why these incursions manifest there every year at roughly the same time on the same day, October 31st, Halloween. One leading theory among Foundation researchers is that these anomalous incursions were triggered in the wake of Lazarevich wearables bankruptcy as part of some attempt by Lazarevich's owners to continue the company's legacy. Alternative explanations have ranged from the company's Halloween costumes being anomalously possessed or haunted, now acting as vessels for demonic entities, deceased spirits, or some otherworldly force. All the Foundation knows for certain is that after sundown, every October 31st since 1997, SCP-6531 has been Whoa. the site of an anomalous incident involving multiple entities designated as SCP-6531-1. These entities can vary drastically in terms of their abilities and appearance, but seem to be restricted to only resembling <laughs> the Chainsaw Halloween Massacre. costumes formerly created and sold by Lazarevich wearables. One year, they might appear as vampires. The following year, could see a group of zombies emerging from SCP-6531. Werewolves, ghosts, and multiple instances of typical depictions of Frankenstein's monster have also been documented. Of the few scraps of information regarding Lazarevich wearables that the Foundation has been able to recover, they have been able to obtain a complete catalog of the costume company's inventory to better prepare engagement countermeasures and containment procedures for each year's manifestation. All recorded okay. incidents, as well as details of effective countermeasures, are available upon request to all Foundation personnel assigned to SCP-6531. The group of SCP-6531-1 entities that manifest at Halloween can total a maximum of a hundred identical costume creatures. They will never emerge later than midnight and will immediately dematerialize once dawn arrives on November 1st. Whether this is caused by an aversion to sunlight or- It's always like a curse. I can find it to Freddy's. Whenever you play the games, the animatronics only ever move after midnight. And they stop around six. So it's like a curse. Or some other anomalous factor that temporarily binds their existence to the night of Halloween is still unknown. These emergences can occur at any time between sundown and sunrise from any of the three entrances to SCP-6531. There is also no other known limitation to the amount of emergences that can occur each Halloween. Some years have passed with only a single group of SCP-6531 entities manifesting. Other years have been considerably more challenging for on-site personnel overseeing containment efforts. Since learning of SCP-6531, the SCP Foundation has enacted standard regional containment procedures, securing the anomalous manufacturing center and the surrounding area. Okay. Civilians are barred from entering the former Lazarevich wearables facility and either turned away or amnesticized if they are found approaching. Although at present, <laughs> nobody has come forward with relevant information regarding the company, should a civilian present themselves as having some foreknowledge of Lazarevich wearables, then they are to be detained and interrogated by Foundation agents on site at SCP-6531. Every Halloween, Mobile Task Force Ada-13, also known under the codename of the Horror Hosts, has been tasked with responding to the annual manifestation events. These operatives, and them alone, are permitted to neutralize instances of SCP-6531 in accordance with the effective countermeasures the Foundation has devised for each possible type of costume creature that can appear. At present, there exists no way of predetermining which of the Lazarevich wearables costumes will appear ahead of manifestation, meaning that the horror hosts have to be prepared for any and all eventualities ahead of Halloween. So it's a gamble. Since there's no designation of what type of entity is going to spawn, they have to put a gamble of what certain security measures for a particular costume and pray that they got it right. Possible countermeasures involve using ultraviolet lights to eliminate vampires, electromagnetic pulse grenades to deactivate robots, and explosive ordnance for undead SCP-6531-1 instances. On the 31st of October 2021, MTF-813 operative John Plummer 
reported for his first assignment to the task force's post overseeing the containment of SCP-6531. For their own safety, the remainder of Foundation personnel had been evacuated. The other 364 days of the year, they were normally involved in researching the anomalous building, trying to examine the exact properties of the former Lazarevich Wearables Manufacturing Center, and hoping to determine the actual cause of the annual emergences. But on Halloween, everyone apart from horror hosts 1, 2, and 3 was granted the treat of a night off. At 7.15, the three members of MTF Eta-13 reported for one more check-in with SCP Foundation Command ahead of the night's inevitable anomalous incursions. Alongside <laughs> Operative Plumber, their latest recruit, were the other two hosts, Alfred Snagrod and Wesley Timid, designated as hosts 1 and 2 respectively. So they're veterans. Each of them performed their radio checks with Foundation Control, host 1 in position with eyes on the north entrance to SCP-6531. A few people- You know, considering the amount of entities that do spawn from this building, why are there only three guys? That's a higher chance for a containment breach, wouldn't you think? Away. Host 2 checked in at the west entrance, and Host 3 did the same, with a clear line of sight to the east entrance. Control issued one more reminder to the trio, instructing them that they were to call in each emergence of SCP-6531-1 and confirm a containment method for each one before deploying countermeasures. Host 2, Wesley Timid, welcomed his fellow horror host, letting the newly recruited plumber know that he could rely on his teammates and to put out a call over the radio if he needed anything. The first night working at keeping emergencies contained could, by his admission, get a little freaky. Host Plumber was grateful and appreciative of his new comrade being so welcoming, and Host Timid explained he saw it as passing along the favor that former oh, Agent here comes that music again. him and Snagrod Something's about to happen. had first joined the horror hosts. Baller had previously stationed at SCP-6531 until his departure from the Foundation, at which point Host oh, so he left. was assigned as his replacement. However. When Plummer asked about his predecessor and why he was no longer an active member of MTF Eta 13, host Snagrod interjected before Timid could offer any answers, commanding the other two hosts to maintain radio silence and stay alert. Within 20 <laughs> minutes, the night's first recorded emergence took place, witnessed by host Plummer at the east entrance. He observed a group of undead shambling out of SCP 6531 in numbers of around a hundred. Startled by the sudden appearance of so many zombies, the horror host's new recruit immediately began preparing explosive ordnance countermeasures, readying a rotary grenade launcher to thin out the encroaching horde. Immediately, host Snagrod spoke up over the radio, commanding host Plummer to stand down. The courtyard beyond the east entrance had already been readied for the emergence with the deployment of landmines, something Plummer got to witness firsthand as some of the decrepit undead stepped their rotten feet in the wrong spot. A rapid series of explosions lit up the courtyard brighter than any seasonal Halloween decoration. Jeez. <laughs> pieces of zombies scattering everywhere, as each of them was splattered almost instantly. Plumber radioed control, informing them that the night's first emergence had been dealt with, leaving behind quite the mess. Another 20 minutes passed before the next emergence of new SCP-6531-1 right, instances. Ghosts. This time, host Snagrod at the North End Manufacturing Center observed a trio of figures dressed oh, in vampires. historical period clothing. It was clear that they were a group of European vampires, meaning Snagrod had only a few moments to act. Given their abilities to turn into bats or travel at speeds nearly imperceptible to the human eye, if these vampires weren't neutralized quickly, they'd be free to wreak havoc, no doubt attacking civilians and draining them of their blood. Fortunately, host Snagrod had enough prior experience of manifestations like this and had just the countermeasure prepared. Birdseed. Birdseed? Radioing Foundation Control to confirm his plan, they gave him the command to engage, and the MTF operative hurled open bags of birdseed in the vampire's direction, causing it to scatter in all directions. Much to host Plumber's confusion, this seemed to stop the three vampires in their tracks Why? as they became fixated on the seeds strewn over the ground before them. But they were trapped, standing still long enough for host Snagrod to activate a series of ultraviolet lights. As the lamps came on, the vampires screamed vulgarities in Romania. Okay, is there something about bird seeds that hypothetically stops vampires? Because I have never heard of such a thing. And I've seen a lot about vampires over the years. Before exploding, making soft popping sounds as they were immolated. Still baffled by the strategy, Plummer asked what the bird seed had been for. 
Snagrod, being slightly more forthcoming when it came to sharing containment tactics, explained that European mythology describes vampires as having a form of erythmomania. This is often an expression of obsessive compulsive disorder, wherein individuals feel a strong compulsion to count their actions or any objects within their immediate surroundings. Using birdseed, Snagrod successfully used this counting compulsion to force the vampires to stay in one place while counting every seed. Oh. 13 minutes past 8, just short of 20 minutes after the previous incident, another emergence began. This time, approximately two dozen skeletons began striding out of the east entrance, some of them armed with swords and axes. <laughs> Once again, host plumber braced himself for a direct fight against the undead. But before he could engage, Snagrod intervened once more, telling him to stand down. No sooner had he said this did Plummer see why. The moment that the oncoming skeleton army stepped outside of the boundary of SCP-6531, they all fell apart. Host Timid chimed in and pointed out that these bony creatures had no muscles, tendons, or any of the other bodily material that keeps bones together, meaning there was nothing for the horror hosts to do but let them disassemble. Plummer noticed that the various skulls now strewn about the courtyard were vibrating, their teeth still chattering. Timid was quick to assure him that they would likely shut up after about half an hour, although it did little to make it seem less messed up. Yeah. <laughs> Only 11 minutes later, host Timid witnessed the first emergence from his post of the night. Out of the west entrance, a group of three robots were marching into view, moving slowly, but each armed with hefty, futuristic-looking weaponry. Snagrod asked if they were sporting any visible shielding, but Timid replied, saying they looked to be old-school retro robots. He told Control he was readying an electromagnetic pulse grenade to take the three anomalous automatons out, but then stopped, claiming he wanted to try an alternative. He leaped out in front of the three robots and yelled at them, This statement is a lie! Immediately, the robots opened fire, prompting Control to ask Timid to report his status. All three of the robots had completely missed him. He already knew that, given that they were older models, their shots weren't being aided by any guidance system. <laughs> the safest spot for him to stand was directly in front of their guns. Over the radio, Snagrod urged Timid, trying to state a logical paradox in order to confuse the robots was pointless, and instructed him to just arm and launch the EMP grenade. Laughing, clearly it was still not worth taking the try, I guess. seriously, Timid tried again, and asked the robots the confusing question of, does the set of all sets that don't contain themselves contain itself? Not waiting to see how the three machines reacted, host Snagrod invoked what he referred to as the Baller Clause. Despite protesting that the robots probably wouldn't hit him, Timid eventually did as instructed and launched the grenade, instantly deactivating all three of the robotic <laughs> SCP-6531-1 instances. Plummer chimed in to ask about the aforementioned clause, and Snagrod explained. Since the horror hosts had been assigned to SCP-6531 for quite some time, they were afforded considerable leeway by Foundation Control when it came to addressing each of the costume creature's emergences. If at any point, one of the trio felt another of their teammates was being reckless, jeopardizing the mission or their own safety, then they could invoke the Baller Clause, which Plummer was quick to notice seemed to be named after his suspiciously retired predecessor, Willard Baller. The next emergence didn't occur until just over an hour later, at 9.29. Once again, Plummer was on the receiving side of a group of SCP-6531-1 instances, all of them scaled humanoids with fins. Yet again, he was ready to enact countermeasures and told to stand by, with Timid even remarking that host Plummer seemed to have beginner's luck. The moment that the half-fish creatures emerged from the building, they dropped and began flopping around on the ground. Oh, uh, because they're fish. Thanks to asphyxiation, since none of them were underwater. Plummer was still unsettled by having to watch the fishy humanoids' bodies flop around, slowly dying. Compared to the skulls, this seemed to be much worse. A full hour and a half passed before Plummer witnessed his next emergence, citing six people brandishing various oh, slashers. melee weapons, ranging from <laughs> knives and axes to chainsaws. According to Snagrod, these were slashers and could be dealt with by using standard ammunition. However, when Plummer opened fire, the six approaching slashers seemed to keep coming. Timid pointed out that these were likely sequel slashers, making them slightly more robust. Upping the countermeasures to explosives, Plummer armed a single grenade and hurled it towards the slashers. All of them were caught in the blast, rendering them neutralized. As Plummer huh. declared the emergence contained, 
Tim had pointed out to not take his eyes off the bodies, as in slasher movies, not yeah, taking the body could mean that the slasher survived. Right. Judging by the disconnected heads and limbs left in the area, Plummer told him it was safe to withdraw that particular concern. Ten minutes later, at a quarter <laughs> past eleven, the next emergence occurred. A group of ectoplasmic entities emerged from SCP-6531's west entrance. These were, as Timid observed, the goopy kind of ghosts. Radioing control for assistance, he asked if the Spanglers had been properly checked. Still learning the lingo on the job, Host Plummer asked what Timid was referring to by Spanglers. This was the nickname given to a series oh, of the door. That's what the, they're at the door. Okay. Entrance by foundation technicians. Oh, I just said. Specially designed to capture ephemeral entities. Upon oh, so Ghostbusters. Within minutes, there were no ghosts left. The latest of the night's emergences having been successfully contained. The next came almost half an hour later, as three hairy humanoid entities in ripped clothing emerged. Plummer readied himself to engage using incendiary rounds, only for Snagrod to tell him that there was no need. Timid pointed out that the ground in front of the werewolves was covered in a veritable meat buffet, thanks to the leftover slasher and fishman remains. Normally, the arrival of werewolves this late on Halloween meant that all the creatures would want to do was eat and would likely fall asleep shortly after, until the sunrise caused them to dematerialize. Although they could be disposed of easily, the werewolves posed no threat, but could be interesting to observe. Doing so was even something of a tradition among the horror hosts that Baller had started. As Plummer watched the group of werewolves, he noticed one picking up the discarded bones from the skeletons and throwing it for another to chase after. With the werewolves eventually falling asleep and no further signs of any anomalous activity, the annual emergences at SCP-6531 had come to a close. Control dispatched cleanup and auxiliary containment crews to the site to take care of the mess left behind while a transport was sent to pick up the three members of the horror host. So we're going to find out what happened Tim to the other operative? The three of them enjoy a nightcap of pumpkin vodka back at base. And while he was happy to join, Plummer felt the need to ask a question that had been bothering him. It was about Baller, former host three of MTF Ada 13. Plummer had noticed that his new teammate seemed sentimental about their former comrade, not to mention the Baller clause being invoked whenever one of them was being reckless. Although Plummer had made it through his first Halloween at SCP-6531, he'd been concerned that his predecessor had died at this post. But both Timid and Snagrod explained that they were only sentimental about Baller because they liked him so much, he'd been a good friend to them. He'd only left the Foundation after receiving a publishing deal for a series of horror novels. Relieved oh. that his job wasn't going okay. to cost him his life, <laughs> Plummer then asked why the Baller Clause was named after him. Barely holding back laughter, Timid explained that a few years prior, Baller had attempted to train one of the werewolves that had emerged from SCP-6531. This had led to an embarrassing encounter between Baller and a six-foot-tall wolf creature being caught on security cameras. Fortunately, Timid pointed out, not everything involving the SCP Foundation resulted in blood and pain. Occasionally, they could be nicer than expected, with personnel able to do their jobs and go home safely living their lives without the risk of being killed by anomalies. <laughs> With that, the three Foundation operatives headed off together to enjoy what was left of their Halloween. Okay, that was actually quite a good one. That was um, not really that crazy. But the beginning part, I guess that was just like a reference for, I guess, for how the video was going to go. But this was actually a pretty pretty nice one. It was, they, they knew what they were doing. They were all in sync. And nobody actually died in this because i was thinking that the predecessors had passed away or something and then that was it but no he was alive he just left because he had a bigger success so that was a nice touch to the end of this but if you guys enjoyed today's reaction video please like comment and subscribe and i will see you guys in the next video bye